Okay, well, um, thank you everybody for coming. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to the uh, opening event of our uh, annual Minden Symposium. Uh, my name is Steve Easterbrook. I'm the director of the School of the Environment. Um, I've been in this role since January, so I'm still kind of learning the ropes, discovering uh, what it's possible to do in uh, interdisciplinary studies within a university environment, which is uh, an interesting journey. Um, before we get into the, uh, the rest of the program, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It's been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. The land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The ter territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place we call Toronto is still a home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the, acknowledge, grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Tonight and tomorrow, we'll be exploring the question of how we can reshape Canada's approach to climate change, an especially urgent challenge now that Canada has acknowledged, declared that we're in a climate emergency. Uh, we have a set of key questions to guide us in our discussions tonight and tomorrow. Let me just remind you what they are. What are the current federal and provincial climate change policies? What can Canada learn from climate policy in other countries? What can labor, business, and activists do to help speed up decarbonization? And what key policies are needed as we go forward? I'd also like to thank our sponsors for tonight, the Beatrice and Arthur Minden Foundation, whose generous donation makes this annual series of symposia possible. And I'd like to acknowledge Joanne Minden, who's uh, able to join us tonight uh, and tomorrow, I hope. Excellent. And I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work of our co-chairs, Jessica Green and Bentley Allen, who have been busy all summer putting together this program. And with that, I'm just going to hand over to our, our, night, our evening speakers. Um, our moderator for this evening is uh, Sean McCarthy. Sean is now, um, he, he's just become, starting a new adventure as senior counsel at the Sussex Group, uh, having just retired from uh, the Globe and Mail, where for many years, uh, he served as a correspondent uh, with special interest in global energy, politics, international affairs. Actually, I've got a long list of topics here. It was a long and, and, and glorious career. Uh, he also teaches journalism at Carleton University and serves as the president of the Canadian Committee for the World Press Freedom. And I'm going to hand it over to Sean to introduce the rest of our speakers. Thank you. I got it now. There we go. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the invitation to me to, uh, to moderate this. Uh, it's my um, pleasure and privilege to uh, moderate with Glenn Murray, who, uh, when I was a reporter, and Glenn was a uh, minister of the Crown here in Ontario, uh, we used to have regular um, conversations and interviews and so on, sometimes not interviews, just conversations. So Glenn is a former um, environment minister in Ontario, now uh, a uh, not quite bi-coastal, but uh, by by city uh, um, um, resident who spends his time between Toronto and Winnipeg uh, doing a lot of interesting things. Peter, Peter Bevan Baker uh, joined us from uh, PEI. He's the leader of the PEI Green Party um, in the legislature there. Um, had a, a major electoral success, not quite the electoral success they were hoping for this year, but a big breakthrough nonetheless, and a huge breakthrough for a Green Party in, in Canada, um, one of the most, I, I believe, the most uh, successful election that the Greens have seen in Canada. So, uh, Peter, we can't see you, but we welcome you. Um, Thank you. Very good. So, uh, <laughs> you're there, good. Um, <laughs> So the first thing we want to do, rather than you know have speeches or or um, launch into uh, into it that way, 
I just wanted to open up a conversation, and, and Peter, um, I, I want to invite you to make this a conversation. Glenn and I talked about this as well. Don't wait for me to prompt you. If, uh, if you hear something ridiculous that Glenn says, just jump right in there and tell him, and uh, he'll do likewise for you, I'm sure. So, um, but I would like to, uh, to kick it off with you and, and maybe give us a sense uh, of Green Party PEI and why you had the success you had and where you think you can make a difference and, and then we'll, um, we'll get off into federal politics as, as well. But we want to talk about um, this, the topic for the, the evening was the, the, uh, the relevance of the US style um, Green New Deal in Canada. And so uh, we will launch into that, but, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to, uh, as I say, introduce the Green Party of PEI and, and why you had the success you had. Well, firstly, thank you very much, Sean, for that introduction. Hello, lovely to meet you and, and Glenn and everybody else. It, it, of course, is a little strange to sit here. I, I guess I am providing the bi-coastal element that you were looking for <laughs> in Glenn and that I'm sitting uh, in the legislature, above the legislature in Prince Edward Island. Uh, where, as you said, uh, the Green Party uh, is the official opposition, which is the first time that's ever happened in the jurisdiction in North America. So it certainly was historic. Why that happened, I think it was a confluence of uh, a number of things. Uh, there is a general malaise and dismay with conventional politics, and that's, uh, that gets expressed in a number of ways. Um, and so people, as they are in many other parts of the world, I think were looking for something different, something that sounded different, something that looked a little bit different, um, but not um, that discomfort, but the inherent discomfort of being a new party uh, was that I had sat in the legislature prior to the, the, most, the most recent election where we became the official opposition uh, for four years and managed to, at least to a certain extent, uh, talk knowledgeably and reasonably rationally on uh, the full range of political topics and issues that came forward. So there was a comfort with the electorate, there was that desire for change. Um, we had a, a really strong platform. Um, the Liberal government was a third term government looking for a fourth term in office, which is almost unheard of here in Prince Edward Island. Um, the other sort of de facto party here, the Conservatives, were in a little bit of disarray. So there was, a, there was a vacuum there and an opportunity. And I think the coming together of all of those elements allowed us to have the success that, that we had last year. Very good. And let me, let me turn to Glenn. Glenn, having been a minister of a government that uh, was very aggressive with uh, climate change policy and really put a, a lot in place that much of it has since been dismantled, um, why don't you launch in a little bit to, to um, the topic of the evening and the, the uh, U.S. style Green New Deal. How does that differ in your view from uh, and how applicable is it to the Canadian context? Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you, when you say aggressive. We were very aggressive as an environmental issue. We were not at all aggressive with it as an economic issue. If, and uh, I, I can't speak of my friend John Godfrey here, who was a senior advisor, and I talked a lot about this over the years, and I can't break confidence, cabinet confidentiality, but suffice to say there was a healthy debate going on in government about which ministry should lead it. Uh, my view has always been that climate change should be led by the minister responsible for economic development or finance. I can explain why. And number two is we were trying to solve an environmental problem, and that's the response and the frame was around that. It's hard to get people excited about that, when in fact what taking the challenge of climate change on is like taking on so many of the other challenges that the UN outlined in the, in the SDG, is that you're talking about massive social transformation that's unprecedented in human history. And that the case for doing it, even if there wasn't climate change, there's a hundred different reasons why you should do it. It's better economics, it creates more prosperity, it raises income, it 
produces healthier communities. It does an enormous number of good things. It changes the technology platform from internal combustion engines to electric motors, which in itself would be a massive productivity gain. You would be retrofitting every building in the province, which would make the New Deal of uh, the the Roosevelt New Deal look like small potatoes. It would be a massive job creator and reduce the structural costs of housing and buildings in the economy. And no one is selling it as that. And I would say simply that if I was back in politics and or if I had won the debates that I never have won in politics, was that I would have just simply said this was a new economic deal and it was about a highly just, inclusive economy built on indigenous principles that is to transform the economy to fully meet a, a wider agenda and no one is doing that and say, by the way, the co-benefit is we'll tackle the climate change challenge as a co-benefit. Peter, do, would, you, would you agree with that thrust? Can you, can you address climate change, confront climate change as a co-benefit to other changes that uh, Glenn was talking about? Absolutely, and I, I like the way Glenn, uh, that uh, Glenn framed that, actually, um, because all too often we talk about the, the climate emergency that we're in now as, as uh, an environmental problem, but really it's an environmental symptom of some much deeper problems, some economic problems uh, that we've created through the systems that we have chosen to adopt uh, over the last 40 or 50 years, and there was an, almost an inevitability about the climate uh, crisis that we face now, if you were to join the dots backwards to uh, the neoliberal um, ideology which, which got going then. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's a, it's a climate emergency, but the roots of the problem lie in the economic system, I believe, that, that we have adopted over the last little while. So in, in the US with the Green New Deal people, um, carbon pricing is, is not a popular um, tool. Um, there, I'm sure there are some who, uh, who would embrace it, but uh, I believe the um, um, resolution that, uh, that went through the Congress that the Democrats supported did not include carbon pricing. Uh, Peter, your uh, platform did include carbon pricing. Glenn, one of the hallmarks of your policies was cap and trade, which is essentially carbon pricing. So where, where where if, if we're having this ground up, burn down the system and build a new one approach, um, does carbon pricing fit into that? And Peter, I'll, I'll uh, start with you since I can't see you and you may be frowning, but uh, and then move no. to, to Glenn. <laughs> no, I'm not frowning. Um, I think carbon pricing has a place and uh, all of the studies, all, all of the evidence would suggest that actually carbon pricing is one of the is actually the most efficient and effective way to reduce carbon emissions. But the problem is that we have fixated on carbon pricing to the exclusion of all of the other things that we have to do. And one of the alarming things for those of us who truly see the situation that we are in now as an emergency, a true emergency, capital E emergency, is that the gap between the solutions that are being proffered by conventional politics and conventional unimaginative politicians and the scope of the issue that we're trying to deal with the gap there is just so enormous and so carbon pricing plays a role it plays a very significant role but alone it will not and cannot uh, provide us with the depth of uh, of change that is required the real fundamental upheaval of so many systems that is required for us to create a situation here where we will live sustainably and, uh, and, and with prosperity and good health um, uh, on a, a safe planet for generations to come. Glenn? I, I agree. Um, what, what was interesting to me is there was something very hopeful in the California-Quebec-Ontario coalition of a carbon market that was one of the largest in the world. No one was really complaining about it. The Chamber of Commerce would put out a, a sort of a notional, maybe you should wait and do it next year kind of thing. Every major industry association that was paying the heavy freight on it endorsed it and helped design it. 
Uh, we were not, as we have recently, losing car manufacturers and industrial infrastructure, which we are now losing. And you were seeing billions of dollars. Nova Corporation was putting billions of dollars into their Corona facility. And, and you were seeing money flowing from cap and trade because the low-hanging fruit was to modernize the energy platform of heavy industry. So surprising to many people, some of the largest early investments were in the oil and gas refining sector in Ontario, which no one imagined, and the application of carbon cure to cement. I mean, the industries that everyone was saying could not change were the ones in which were the largest investments. And the modernization of those facilities, which were securing those industrial facilities and modernizing so they didn't relocate because they're all 50, 60, 70 years old, like our public infrastructure are past their best, be best before date, contrary to what the government of the day said, you were actually seeing pools of capital being created because they could trade those reductions which they were getting by moder modernizing the energy platform of the industrial facilities. But no one wanted to talk about that. And there's a very interesting series of articles I'd recommend to you in the Guardian newspaper, it was in the weekly, talking about the silence of the green monsters. The fact that the corporations that are doing the most leading work in reducing greenhouse gases, plastics, and waste are absolutely silent about it and the dynamics of the culture war and the corporate risk loss of shareholder confidence and fear of customer, customers seeing upward pressure from that has silenced this and this culture war that's going on. So I, I think that's what's interesting is when cap and trade was dismantled, it was a Republican idea that the Republicans came up with in the states to challenge the Democrats' ideas of a carbon tax. No one was complaining about it. There was no evidence to review what the impacts on the economy and jobs were. People like Jerry Dias of Unifor and Steve Williams from Sun Corps were all on the same page on it. And if you can get the head of an oil sands company and a large labor union and environmental defense to agree on something, there was a consensus. But it tells you how deeply this is a non-evidence-based culture war we're in. And the thing that I would, the other piece of advice I would have today is you, we have to realize we're in a major culture war in the world right now. And the other side is fighting a culture war. And we are Boy Scouts, you know, duct tape to the bunk bed at camp because we don't have our sharp elbows up. And I think we have to get smarter about how we're playing the politics of climate change. All right, I want to get into the culture war in, in a bit because I agree with you. It's, um, you know, when, when uh, Donald Trump says he want, they want to take your hamburgers away and, and your, your plastic straws and, you know, gets the kind of reaction he gets, it's clearly part of a culture war. But, um, but I want to stop on the, on, the, on the carbon price issue for a minute because it is a significant difference between the Green New Dealers in the United States and, and what we've seen from the Green Party um, in Canada. The Green Party nationally um, has a carbon, would, would basically take the liberal carbon tax, add $10 to it every year until you got to $130. Um, uh, $130 a ton by 2030. So there, there is no serious carbon climate policy in Canada that does not include a, an explicit carbon tax, although it's debated. You know, Mark Jacquard in, in British Columbia tells us we don't need one, and it's not the most politically popular way to go, so maybe we should ditch it. I've, I've heard more of these calls. But in the U.S., you hear it's it's a it's a um, cost of doing business. It's a price to pollute. The market mechanism leaves um, underserved uh, communities or or those in the shadows of the major uh, refineries and industrial plants still uh, subject to um, to environmental degradation and and health impacts. So. So what's, why are they wrong and we're right? Or why, why does, how would you, dis, how would you talk to, to your American friends about why carbon pricing um, is, is something that should be um, part of uh, the toolbox? Go ahead, Glenn, uh, and then... And then well, why don't we go to Peter? Why don't we go to the right, Cradle Peter, you start. with someone who actually won an election on this or paid right. down close. <laughs> 
Well, I, I should correct Glenn. We didn't actually win, although, it, uh, as Sean said, we made some some steps forward. But let me deal with the. You mentioned about the political um, sort of hot potato that the carbon pricing is, um, because any time you have a tax, uh, the word tax is a, attached to a policy. Of course, it becomes it becomes politically very very dodgy. Um, and here on the island, we were attacked by all other parties, actually, to varying degrees. Um, for our stance on what was really not a sufficiently robust carbon tax anyway, um, but it was part of our, our program. The Liberals here, the, the preceding government, had introduced um, a, a carbon tax of sorts, uh, where they taxed carbon to the same extent that the, the federal backstop was, but they gave three quarters of it back to islanders by reducing uh, the provincial tax at the pumps. So it was it was an absolutely ludicrous um, and ineffective way to to implement the carbon tax. Um, so yes, we we did run with carbon tax, and it it was, you know, we expected it to be the defining issue of the election, as I think many people perhaps expected the current federal election to be run on carbon taxation. And uh, sitting here in Prince Edward Island, I have to say I haven't had a an enormous amount of contact with what's going on uh, federally, uh, but I mean, you can, of course, I'm a politician. I'm watching what's happening. But it seems to me that a carbon tax is actually not uh, a core issue here in this election. Uh, certainly, climate change has become one. Um, but here on the island, the issue of a carbon tax, which was which was demonized, particularly by the progressive conservatives, the party that won here, um, was. It was a, it was a touchy issue, of course, but um, I I would hate to say, and I don't I don't believe it had anything to do with the fact that we didn't manage to win the election. I think uh, we had a long time to present it, um, to explain it. But one of the problems, of course, is that it's not a simple thing. Um, carbon taxation, whether you what you do with the money after you collect it, uh, is there are so many options, and it's difficult sometimes um, to present a politically unpalatable thing like that in the soundbite manner that is demanded by conventional politics uh, without actually creating problems. So not, I've sort of talked around your question here. I'd be interested to hear what Glenn has to say on this. And I just want to um, just make a point that the, the federal rebates are, are not, they also give the money back, not through lowering your gas taxes, uh, but right through the income tax yep. uh, system. Uh, Many of you would have received a check, and and um, Elizabeth May's plan is she calls it a uh, fee and dividend, um, essentially the same thing. She would send the money back to uh, to individuals through the income tax system or a direct check. So, Glenn. Well, I, let's be. Uh, I'm not in politics anymore, so I can speak my mind. It's the first time I've actually spoken in public since I was a minister. So, now you know what I really think. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, it, most of what's going on right now is complete nonsense, quite frankly. I, I, I don't see much going on in the country right now that approaches a serious effort to meet the level and severity of the crisis. Uh, since 2006, the boreal forests ceased being a carbon sink and has since been a carbon source. And when it is eight degrees warmer in winter, sometimes over the next 25 years, this massive carbon sink, now a mild carbon source, will become a severe carbon source. And please tell me, in the collective ability of 36 million people to offset a degrading forest and compensate for the amount of carbon dioxide and methane that will be released in the next 30 or 40 or 50 years by what was our biggest carbon absorption asset. You know, this idea of planting a trillion trees and capping emissions is a pretty good beginning. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, that. Carbon pricing, you know, John Polanyi was asked, and I was sitting in this very room with one, and he was asked by some graduate students, Professor Polanyi, could you answer the following, finish the following sentence for me? We live in the age of, and he said, acceleration. And he went on to point out that all the graduate students in one way or the other, whether they were working on algorithms in the stock market, climate change, or the cultural identity of Jewish people, were all dealing with issues of accelerated change beyond the capacities of people to learn, 
understand or manage. The things move too fast for human beings to manage. And we're in this accelerating level of change that is changing exponentially. So it's very hard to redirect things once the wheels are rolling. When I was in the Ontario cabinet, cap and trade made was a very sensible policy because it would accelerate the price without any legislature ever having to vote on it. We watched in BC the rather anemic increases and then the non-increases. And very, very, very few legislatures anywhere in the world have been prepared outside of Norway to pass a price that is a severe enough price to deter or change the fundamental economics. And when you had 20, 30, or 40 years to affect that change, those kinds of pricing systems made sense. Now the IPCC is saying we basically have a decade and change. It's very hard to construct a politically acceptable carbon price that can be implemented in that time frame at a level that would allow a party to get elected. The cap and trade system was interesting in the way that California and Quebec and Ontario constructed it because of the social equity model, and that largely goes to Governor Brown, Kathleen Wynne, and uh, Kevin DeLeon, and the coalition, David Hertel, of people who actually built in a poverty investment formula that ensured that a significant amount of the money went into social equity, and there was none of this, just give the money back. It was to build the sufficient pools of capital for massive infrastructure building transformation, massive investments in social housing, and sufficient, like $20,000 grants to households, which were at a scale where you could actually change your furnace out and, and do the changes in your house. It was actually scaled in one of the few, and it was quite, it's working, and it's working well in Quebec, and it survived a conservative government there, and it survived and expanding dramatically in California. So you can see the model is continuing to work. But today, with the time frames we have, the, the, the options of trying to find a mechanism that's politically sustainable is difficult. And there's two things that I would say, and I'll, I'll, be, and I'll, sh I'll, I'll try to finish this in 30 seconds. One is that I think we're on a war footing. Like, I think that you have to think about this now as preparation as we did for the Second World War, where government now has to directly intervene in the way we built a massive Navy, a massive Air Force, and say, we're going to change the technology platform of buildings, transportation, heating and cooling systems and energy in this country right away, and we're going to do it on a New Deal type scale, on a Rooseveltian kind of way, in the way that we dealt with the Depression and the Second World War, that we're beyond the idea of market signals, even though I think markets work because they deploy capital and and talent and technology faster than almost anything else. And if you can harness Google to do something other than create the next generation of style obsolescent cell phone and actually have them actually introduce technology using their marketing ability, that would be great. But there's so much greenwashing that that's it. And the second thing is that it's city municipal up. So what I'm working right now in Winnipeg, a city where I have some gravitas and relationships, having been the mayor there and been away, when you go away and you leave people and they forget it's like being, David Crombie says, it's like being dead. They forget you ever did anything wrong, and they just remember the good things. So I'm, I, I, I never want to go back into politics, because I don't want to remove that illusion and remind people of my imperfections. But um, this idea of coalition building, of, of actually taking community, municipal, business, not-for-profit, indigenous women's leadership, and creating a coalition that identifies all the things in your community that you can change, and then getting the leadership from across society, across sectoral, to manage that change, I think is the most effective way to do it. And the Bloomberg model and the C40 model and the kind of stuff right now, I think, is the way to do it. And universities could be central to that if they wanted to be. So, so we're talking about um, a culture war, and we're talking about recognizing that we are in a culture war. And therefore, there's, there's another side um, that we will not come um, to any kind of agreement with. Does, does that f free us up then to not seek um, collaboration with those in the center right? Uh, Patrick Brown was going to bring in a carbon tax when he came in. Um, there are conservatives. Um, not a lot of them these days, but there are, they're still out there who uh, believe that climate change is the issue of the day and we need to respond to it, and they would do it in, in market-based fashion. So, so how, do we, 
how do we proceed politically trying to build as big a coalition as we can because of the size of the action that we need and the, and the political uh, credibility that re is required while still, you know, really um, urging fundamental change to the structures of, of the economy? Well, I think you've got a challenge because you have to have some receptors on the political right to build that bridge. I'm not sure they're there. So what are the options that we have? One is regulation. Well, I can't find a conservative believer in breathing anywhere in North America that is in favor of greater government regulation standards or those kinds of things. So that one's, that one's off the table, I think, from conversation. Certainly, the entire ethos now of the Jason Kennys and the Doug Fords is less government and complete abandonment of that. Uh, the convention that came out of the right in North America was cap and trade, but then was it was embraced by Canadian liberals and Jack Layton, New Democrats, and Greens. And by Democrat, by Nancy Pelosi, and by Democrats in the states, uh, uh, cap and trade became the invented by the right. As a matter of fact, I was told that there was a professor here at University of Toronto who was an economist who actually advanced the first model of cap and trade exchange back about 20 years ago. So U of T, another unsung hero out there somewhere. But that transformation is rather remarkable. But it's the, but cap and trade, which was harnessing markets, the most conservative idea, harnessing markets and transactional relationships where the value of a reduction could be monetized and traded. If you can't support that and you're a conservative, what do you actually believe in? And what we have is a culture war where markets are now under attack by people like Trump and Johnson, and trade is under attack. I mean, the people who advance globalization and free trade are now the biggest critics of it, the next generation, and, and, and a lack of rational. I mean, I, I was saying to Sean earlier, I, there was an article in the, I, I become a great reader of The Guardian, who was saying that even though Donald Trump has said that he actually talked to the president of Ukraine about Biden and has admitted that freely that two thirds of Republicans don't believe he ever did and think it's absolutely insulting, suggest he did, and they still believe, two thirds of Republicans still believe Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. So I mean, you're literally at a point where truth has never as it has for. And and if, you know, I always think the most important book to read today is Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, to see in three books the structured destruction of truth, because it happened once before. And the alignment of what she observed actively in those three volumes is extremely useful and informative to understand how you can literally have someone say something, like Donald Trump own it, and then be told that you're insulting him by agreeing with what he said. I mean, th th there is a level of absurdity to this that is reinforced by social media, the instantaneous gratification of emotions, uh, and a culture war that is around identity and a sense of being offended and left out. This idea that there is always someone better off than you, and that is the person that you can blame, and, and, and that politic is very hard. What's going to be destructive, what's really, what keeps me up at night, if you're asking that question? Uh, I watched Syria, 8.6 million people being displaced by a one in 900 year drought that saw a massive collapse of agricultural production, 50,000 farmers, the rural backbone of that democracy, producing food, moving into cities where they lost because they lost their farms, they weren't producing food, they were bereft of food and water, and you had the first major environmental movement and water and food security issue. I would suggest to you that the report that came out with the Mexican government suggesting that about half of Mexican farms will cease operation in the next 12 years. If you look at the water wars on river diversions right now in Mexico, and you imagine 10, 20, 30 million Mexicans going through a one in 900 year drought that lasts six years and causes massive food and water security issues in Mexico, and they start looking north towards the border, and you look at the culture war that's already going on in the United States, what a couple of thousand Central Americans created as a fuss, you've now got the dynamics for destabilizing migration and food and water security issues that I think are going to further destabilize government. If I, I was in Eastern Europe recently, and I went there just to understand what the fallout from that mass mi Middle Eastern migration was on the politics of Hungary and uh, Romania and Austria and Poland, and it was fascinating to me how the xenophobia and nativism most people would own was a direct response to that mass migration from a mass drought in Syria that the Pentagon pointed out was one that was the biggest destabilizer 
a contributing factor to the destabilization of the Syrian government in the Civil War. And I think that's the kind of thing that you're going to see happening around the world, and that will destabilize democracies, and that will create the capacity of sane, liberal democratic government's ability to scientifically respond to climate change and to have a humanitarian response to this rather than a military one of rushing, what I suggest we do, rush Canadian aid workers down there, bring people from Central America here, help resettle and feed them, and start looking at this as a global humanitarian uh, uh, effort rather than the militarization of climate change impacts on the people who are least responsible for it and are going to bear the brunt of it are now going to be militarized and weaponized in this. And I think that to me is going to make the oil wars of the last century look like small potatoes. Like we really have a global stabilization issue around from the impacts of water and food security on democracy and stability of government and borders. I think that is something Canada desperately needs to, to step up on and should be a central issue about what is our role as one of the few safe haven countries left in the world. What are we going to do to prevent this destruction of, of, of a global consensus? Uh, uh, of, of how are we going to deal with this issue of mass environmental migration? Okay, Peter, I want to come back to you on, on, the, on the question, which was um, efforts to, to build as broad a consensus of the need for action as, as we can. Um, and where, uh, in, in, in Prince Edward Island, do you simply g give up on the Conservative Party there as, as a positive force for climate action? And, and do you across the country? And, and if so, what does, that, what does that mean for our politics? Well, to, the, to the first Part, Sean, absolutely not. And actually, the premier here is cast from the red Tory cloth. Um, he he is absolutely not your. He's not a Doug Ford. He's not a Jason Kenney, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, very. He's a very. Well, I have to be careful how I choose my words here. But he's absolutely somebody I feel I can work with and have worked with. Uh, we have a very close and and good working relationship. So. Uh, absolutely, he represents the Progressive Conservative Party, which by name uh, is, you know, running so many provinces and uh, across this country. But he is, uh, he again is a, a red Tory. So I, I feel no, absolutely no reason why I can't continue to work with him productively and, and his party. Um, I think Glenn really touched on a couple of very critical elements here about building um, uh, gathering together enough people to to make this transformation happen, and and it's regarding the political challenges that that are that that anybody in a position like myself faces. Um, Glenn said for the first time in his life uh, since retiring from politics, he he felt he could openly speak his mind, and we need uh, we need a political environment, a political culture that allows politicians to be a little more bold, um, to not be so timid, to embrace large, difficult, complicated, um, risky, and perhaps very expensive ideas in the hope that the electorate will go along with that. I think there are an enormous number of political challenges that face, uh, that face active politicians now in making this work. Uh, I look at the fact that the climate change emergency doesn't actually feel very much like an emergency. The weather changes from day to day, and and it's not you know you're not being invaded by a foreign force. It's not a uh, it's not an asteroid that's streaking towards us at you know million miles an hour. It's going to impact next week. Um, th there's a sense that this we call it a climate emergency, but for most people, it's very difficult to actually accept that it is. I think that's one political problem. So mobilizing people in a manner uh, that, that will actually get us to do the things we have to do is, is very difficult. I think politics itself lends, the politics lends itself to incrementalism and, and the sort of status quo. And it's very difficult uh, because the currency of politics and politicians is popularity. And if you're gonna bring forward ideas that seem uncomfortable or unfamiliar and again, or potentially risky in the in the eyes of the electorate, that's a very that's a very bold and an unpolitical thing to do. 
but it's what we have to do. And it's another political challenge is that the culture, the traditions of politics do not lend themselves to coming forward, except Glenn mentioned the, the, the war status in Churchill and Mackenzie King, and, and actually Elizabeth May has cited that as, as a, a metaphor for what we have to do, and I absolutely believe that she's right. Um, we have public cynicism surrounding politics and politicians as well, that they can't get the job done. They make promises, but they can't keep them, and they don't have the guts or the courage to actually make difficult decisions. And I think in the eyes of too many of the electorate, politicians are no longer leaders, they're followers, and that's not going to cut it in this. We, 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 need, we need something much bigger than that. One of the other problems, and, I, and I'm, I'm getting back to the Green New Deal here, is that we haven't managed to clearly articulate um, a comfortable alternative or something that is actually going to get the job done. Um, and I think that's, that's an enormous uh, political challenge ahead, is to, is to somehow explain to the populace, to the electorate, that this is a problem which does require economic, social, and environmental um, changes at a level we've we've never had them before. So that that to this point, anyway, lack of articulation of, of, of an alternative, a credible alternative, is a, is a huge problem. Um, I think also politicians tend to operate on very short time frames. Um, they're more concerned about, um, and Glenn will absolutely, <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, not disagree with this, that they're far more concerned about the next term in office than they are about long-term solutions to complicated problems. So politics does not lend itself to the sorts of deep changes, uh, systemic structural changes that the, the implementation of a Green New Deal requires. And of course, we have you talked about a cultural war. We have very active campaigns of misinformation. Um, very well-funded campaigns of misinformation. All of these things make um, people in a position like myself or any politician across the country articulating something like this in a legislature and during an election or a campaign um, and expecting to gather around enough people to, to get the votes required to, to actually bring forward legislation is, is an incredibly difficult and challenging thing. One thing I, I should... I, I, and again, I'm going to finish up shortly, Sean, but one of the great advantages of being a politician on Prince Edward Island is the intimacy of the politics here. Uh, we're a small place and we have, a, we have a, an opportunity to be nimble and, and to maneuver and change in a way that many other larger uh, jurisdictions uh, do not. So I think PEI, I mean, we've already made some breakthroughs in terms of of legislative changes in the last election. But I also think that the opportunity exists here because of our smallness, our nimbleness, our, our ability to actually change fairly quickly, um, and the intimacy of the politics, that we could actually change on a small scale here in a manner that we could be a model um, or a beacon for the rest of the world. Well, well that's, that's how you produce true sustainability. That's what, that's what um, a, a, a progressive, um, society that that will provide for its for future generations of to, for many generations to come looks like so the there are absolutely enormous political challenges but I think a unique opportunity here on Prince Edward Island to deal with that so you you referred to something um, that um, um, presaged my my uh, my next question and and that is PEI serving as a, as a beacon. I've, I've often heard um, from people, and, and I sat down with a friend around my kitchen table yesterday morning, uh, used to work for the Liberal government, um, and is not persuaded that Canada has a huge role to play in this because of the small, relatively small scale of our contribution, which is 1.6% of global emissions. Um, the, the, the other side here uh, would, would have us say, in fact, I, I uh, quoted Andrew Scheer uh, from the other day saying that um, we could shut down our economy today and China would fill in the emissions 
within a matter of weeks. Now, that's not true. It's not that far off, though. We could, Canadian emissions are equivalent to two years of recent growth of Chinese emissions. Uh, a, a year's worth of Canadian emissions are, are, are uh, equal to uh, just the growth uh, of two years. So what role for Canada? I mean, we, we, we hear the politicians, we have to get a handle on this, we have to remake our, our economy as if, if we do this, it's problem solved. It's not, and we all know it's not. And, the, and I would suggest that the politicians who are urging this on us um, are doing us a disservice by suggesting that it is because they create a straw man that is pretty easy for the other side to knock down. Len. So I find that I, I hear that from liberal friends of mine. I, I should say I am not a member of any political party right now, and I can explain why that is. Um, and I have very strong feelings about democracy today and what we all need to do to save our democracy, because I think it's under threat. Uh, I, think, oh, I think what uh, the lieutenant governor of this province is doing in her conversations around democracy are very important. I think what the Pemben Institute, which I was proudly part of, did with the Narratives Project, which, which was an opportunity for conservatives in Alberta to join a broad coalition of conser other conservatives to change the conversation and language, uh, won awards for that, and that was destroyed by the right. So it's very hard even when you get progressive pieces. But the narrative and language around this, most of us are children of people who either suffered through residential schools and some of the most disturbing things that we have ever seen happen to human beings, and they had the courage to rise above it and continue to struggle to rise above it. We are people who came from Holocaust, war, famine, genocide, poverty, and survived fascism and totalitarianism, and we rose above it. We took on the Second World War as a small country of inconsequential military strength, and we became one of the most important factors in defeating totalitarianism in the world. This country is one of the most special places in the world. Being Canadian is having the courage to stare down and fight oppression and hatred and go to war when necessary. It is having the compassion to have a humanitarian response when there is crisis in the world. There it is the idea of being a haven and welcoming people when no one else will. But more than anything else, it is not measuring ourselves by how big a part of the problem we are, but how big a part of the solution we can be. And if there is anything in the leadership crisis in this country, is that there is nobody in political leadership today saying Canada, this country has a greater capacity, the best universities, the most enormous resource base, the most stable politics, the incredible resources and technology and moderate politics that we can actually demonstrate events and advance the solutions to climate change and deploy them and export them more than any other country in the world. There is no country that could be a bigger part of the solution than we can. And the irony is, unlike the Second World War where a generation went off and gave up their lives on battlefields for a cause, we are asking you to ride your bicycle, use an electric car, and retrofit your frigging home. This is not a sacrifice. This is reducing your cost of living, improving the health of your children. Maybe a generation ago, 80% of them walked to school. Today, 80% of them get driven. I mean, we literally are asking people to improve their quality of life and reduce their cost of living. We are measuring ourselves by how we think we are insignificant after a century where our smallness, our, our, our ability to dare the world and challenge the world, 
where we changed the outcome and course of history in the last century and we're not prepared to step up? These are people who have forgotten where they came from and forgotten who we are and are more concerned about Twitterverse than they are about the reality of where and how we live and they cannot even show the political leadership to make a low carbon economy attractive, exciting and healthier that somehow building buildings that last 25 years is a good idea. We can't sell people best. I just came into a community where the average home was 800 years old. With this idea of having buildings without best before dates is somehow complicated. It's a difficult political pitch. Like, it's really pathetic. I, I, I think we are faced with one of the most incompetent generations of political leadership in Canadian history right now because I've never seen a group of people less able to provide the kinds of leadership that we need right now, quite frankly. And, and I found it very frustrating being in that system where I found a few people, mostly women, and the previous premier we had was absolutely transformational. She was one of the most amazing people. And if you actually look at all the things that being, are being destroyed right now, they're all the things that the Green Party is, says they want to do if they get into power. You just had one of the greenest governments ever here, and we don't have the dynamics and the misogyny around women in leadership roles, which I can talk about, was, is really a problem. We had six premiers four years ago. We have no women premiers. We have a real problem emotionally with misogynist frameworks around women and women's ability to take on leadership roles, which is something us guys need to do something about. But there is really a problem in political leadership right now. Because I don't think the challenge is that enormous. I just think there's a lack. I, I think if you had someone on our side who was as ferocious in their politics as the Jason Kennys and the Doug Fords were, and un unapologetic for doing the right thing, we'd be way farther ahead right now. It's just a bit too mealy mouthness right now, in my view. So. All right. Are you sure you're done in politics? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm out of electoral politics. I am so into politics like I've never been. You're sounding, yeah. you know, like you, you could make a run here. No. <laughs> no? Definitely okay, not. Just, just checking. Peter, would you, would you take that on, this, this idea um, that, you know, we are too small part of, part of the problem, and I refer to it as the but China line. Right. Sure. Well, as the mealy mouth contributor, um, I, uh, there's, a, there's a nice analogy here because PEI, of course, being uh, the smallest province with 150 something thousand people, has never managed to wield any sort of um, authority or influence in the Federation of Canada. But what we have managed to do through some very fine premiers of the past is to be a conscience and to be an inspiration for the rest of the country. Uh, we can't, again, we have no economic clout, but my goodness, we can produce um, articulate visionary leaders, and we have done. Um, I think Canada on a global scale could, could do exactly what Glenn just said so eloquently. Um, yes, we only represent 1.6% of the global emissions. However, we are, at per capita, one of the worst emitters. We are in the top three, I believe, in terms of per capita emissions. So we're not looking at, we should not look at the contribution of our country as a whole. This is a global problem. And we as individuals here on, in Canada are emitting far more than our fair share. So I, I do believe Canada can be a leader like you, Sean. I, I took that very passionate and eloquent speech that Glenn just made as his per perhaps reintroduction to politics. And I would like to encourage him to do that. We do not have good leadership here. One, one thing I, I'd like to pick up on, and he mentioned about misogyny in politics, um, and that's alive and well everywhere we look. I am blessed with a caucus of eight members, five of whom are women. And I can tell you that it absolutely changes the dynamic of caucus discussions of the atmosphere in the legislature, of the attitude um, that those women bring to the job. Uh, the first motion that we passed in our legislature as the uh, official opposition was to end heckling. And that has happened. And I can't tell you what a profound impact that has had on the quality of debate in the Prince Edward Island legislature. People listen to each other. I mean, there's still partisanship and there's still a certain amount of you know, the, the, the odd thing gets thrown across the floor. But that's because of the five women 
that are a part of this caucus. So I absolutely agree with Glenn that the old style uh, leadership, which was almost all uh, historically, of course, male, um, has led us in part to where we are now. And it is women. And I mean, of course, I'm surprised that Greta Thunberg has not come up in, in the conversation yet today, but it is the youth of today who are providing the inspiration. And that's not the way it should be. The politicians should be the leaders. It should be the people who have the levers of power who are able to do that. And they are impotent. They, we are impotent. We are, we are timid. We are not willing to take a risk and, and go out there and trust that the electorate is ready to do this. And as Glenn said, this is nothing, that there is no sacrifice here in, in relative terms compared to what has gone on before. There are so many opportunities. It's, what if it's all a big hoax and we just create a better world for no reason? And you know, there's this list of, of attributes and preserving ecosystems and having healthy people and, 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 and water and green jobs and, and livable cities and all of those things. These are the things that we can create at the same time as we are solving the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. So, so the sacrifices, um, however, don't fall evenly, right? Um, there are regions of this country um, that depend on the fossil fuel economy for their wealth and jobs um, and are being told that um, more quickly or, or slower, um, that economy will end. And, and um, in the last several years, the, uh, the um, argument has been that it has to happen, and we've heard it from the UN. Uh, the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees was a was a uh, you know very alarming wake up call um, that it has to happen quickly and that they don't have the time for the kind of transition that maybe 10 years ago people were telling them they had even though the, it's an argument that they didn't take much advantage of it. Um, so what do we what, how do we deal with with a large section of this country? that depends on, on oil and gas, and you know, we're moving off coal and their electricity, but electricity was 85, uh, coal was 85% of their electricity, oil and gas is the foundation of their economy, and they grow beef cattle, and now they're being told stop. So a federal government that is, probably if, if a federal government gets elected that is going down this road, is not going to include many people from that region of the country. Uh, you're both either active politicians or um, reformed politicians, recovering politicians. How do you how do you deal with this reality that 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 a big chunk of this country um, will have to make transitions that are going to be painful. I, I, I don't think there's any other way to cut it. Well, I, I think you've seen it with Greta Thunberg. She's telling the truth. What a novel concept. Um, we're not, ha I mean, I, we're not having an honest conversation in Canada right now. Kind of, I mean, the science is evident. You can read it. There's a lot of it going on in this campus. We know we have 12 years to implement solutions, not develop them. We know we don't have till 2050 to get to carbon neutrality. It has to happen long before that. We know that that transformation leaves us, if properly executed, uh, a stronger, healthier country with cleaner air, better diets and healthier food. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I have a little, when I give my talks, I have a little map of Canada's energy, GHG, and GDP since 1926, which was the first year that we had any significant impact of oil and gas to come to the Alberta. And you know, until 1957, which is the year I was born, 
every unit of economic growth is matched by a proportional increase in per capita energy use and GHG emissions. From, and we built a lot of suburbs in those areas. So I go to the shining burb of Transcona in Winnipeg, or I go out to Mimico here, and you're looking at communities where the people who lived in them at the time they were built were living on about somewhere between one-sixth and one-eighth the amount of energy that we use today. We use about eight times as much energy as we did when I was born and four times as much energy when I graduated from high school. So we're not going, and they had big, ugly cars back then with weird fins and fenders and things like that. This was not some radical green nirvana. I mean, we just have to go back a generation to neighborhoods that had main streets when, you know, in Transcona, everybody walked in the 40s and 50s and 60s to the local grocery store. No one thought to take a car. Everyone walked to school. It wasn't that long ago. Since then, those were 1,200, 1,400 square foot houses. Now we have 4,000 square foot houses, and we now, have, we now drive, and we now have to use a liter of gasoline to get a liter of milk, and nothing's walkable. But if you actually look from 1957 on, when we built disposable houses, and we created low-density sprawl, and, and then we introduced the electronic age, where electronics have now passed transportation as the major source of energy use, those two things basically changed it. So is it that hard to re re-engineer it. I don't think it's that hard to re-engineer it. I, I think that, you know, with autonomous and electric vehicles, you can re-engineer the transportation system in some cases, and many, many communities can be re-engineered to be walkable. And you can probably do that in Canada in about a 10-year period of time, but you have to commit and start now and do it right away. We'll it's come not back to the regional issue. Yeah. Come back to the, the issue that this, there are economies the, the, the economy of Ontario okay. is oh, not Alberta. dependent on on oil and gas. The economy of Quebec is certainly not dependent on oil and gas. But the the economy of Alberta yeah. is. So how do you deal with the Albertans when they have so Sault Ste. nobody Marie's, in the government so and you're telling them they have to Sault Ste. stop? Sault Ste. Marie's economy is entirely dependent on Alberta. The two largest employers there basically have a customer base that is 80% Alberta. So there is this huge dependence. They pull the stuff out of the ground, but if you redistribute the the emissions out of the tailpipe that comes out of the ground, and you redistribute that based on use, not based on extraction, we all share a equally difficult problem. So two things that I would say in Alberta. One is there is no way, there is no good news for Alberta in this in the political context today. There, I, I don't know that there is a way to go to Alberta and tell you everything's going to be okay. I think that's a problem, and I think it just has to be dealt with. Time, time, sorry. The second part of it is, is this. There's a lesson in Alberta that the narrative that I would use, and I lived in Calgary and ran, led an environmental, ran the Pemmin Institute for a year. It was a fascinatingly educational experience. But in 30 to 40 years, we pulled billions and billions of dollars of international capital, private capital, and private Canadian capital. We put billions and billions of dollars of federal tax money and Alberta tax money to take bitumen out of sand. And in 30 years, we took something that was basically not an industry and built the largest energy infrastructure complex in human history and introduced technology and deployed capital, talent, and technology at an accelerated scale unlike anything done. It's the biggest nation-building project we had probably bigger than the national dream in some ways. The message, I think, in Alberta and the narrative if I was prime minister right now would be to say to Alberta, we need your leadership. The only place in the world that's ever organized energy transformation and adapted technology and built infrastructure in such a short period of time ever is the Alberta economy. And we're darn proud of Albertans. And we're darn proud of the oil sands because at that time, with the knowledge we had, was an extraordinary accomplishment and created massive wealth for this country. But now the world has changed, and we need that leadership. So we're going to commit to work with Alberta to build a new energy complex in Alberta and across the country faster, at a higher level of productivity, 
with a cleaner energy source, and we're going to ensure that Albertans benefit from that. But we want Steve Williams to leave Suncor, who's in a pretty progressive guy. We're going to build a new coalition for a new energy economy in Canada, and we want Alberta to be at the center of it. Now, I don't think that will get you any votes in Alberta, quite frankly, mm -hmm. because I don't think they're ready for that conversation. But that would be the nar nation-building narrative that I would take and just have to suck it up and realize you're not going to get any votes in Alberta, which for liberals and for Greens has not exactly been fertile, sort of like, <laughs> so you're going to lose four seats. It's not the end of the world. And you might actually pick up compensatorily a lot more seats in Atlantic Canada, Ontario, and Quebec. And you might have a narrative that actually inspires Albertans to be less afraid to realize that what they now have to do in the next 30 years, they're the only Canadians who've ever done anything at that scale in the last 30 years. So I just think we need a more creative and courageous narrative around that, but I'm not so naive to believe that that's the solve that will solve the problem, but we need a nation building. We cannot keep trying to be all things to all people. Build high-speed rail at 300 kilometers between Toronto, Edmonton, Vancouver, uh, and Winnipeg, and Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and Quebec City, and build a new national rail system, which we could do pretty much for the cost of the pipelines that are being subsidized. And you might make a whole much more Canadians. How fun you could, if you started that four years ago, you'd probably be way more popular than you are right now. But better organized trains between Montreal and Toronto that still take four or five hours to get there aren't going to change the dynamics of, of, of fuel. So, I mean, it's just a bit more imagination, a bit more courage, and not making everyone else the problem. And, th and that goes both sides. There's, there's this narrative on the right that, that attacks everyone who is in Alberta as not caring about them. And there's, and there's people on the left who just want to make Alberta the problem every time they put their key in their ignition, like there's no relationship between you know, the, 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 the four SUVs that you find in the average home in Brampton or Mississauga and the Alberta oil demand challenge. Like we have to, oh, have some, we have to share this problem, not blame each other for it. And I think there's a lack of that right now. The politics of blame and division are just way too convenient today on both sides. Peter. Peter, can you, um, can you take that comment? Yeah, off? sure. I, 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 I'm not sure if I am cutting out at your end, but unfortunately I'm, I'm missing bits of the conversation and things that are being said. So my apologies if I either repeat something Glenn has said or if, I'm not, not, if I disappear. Um, the, the issue of a just transition is, of, of course, critical, but it doesn't just apply to Alberta. Um, the, the major economic drivers here on Prince Edward Island are agriculture and the fisheries and tourism. All of those things are entirely dependent on stable climate, which we no longer have. Um, so the economies of every region of the country for varying reasons and in different ways are going to be affected uniquely. Um, and that's not to say that Alberta is not a, you know, it, it is in a unique circumstance, of course, because of the nature of, the, of the, the, the dependence of fossil fuels on their economy traditionally. So a just transition is going to be extremely important there. Um, and involving the, well, I mean, Elizabeth May has talked about this um, at length. I really, I feel as a provincial politician at the other end of the country, I'm not, I shouldn't really delve into, into Alberta Alberta politics, but I think I can talk um, at a high level about the regional challenges that a country like Canada faces. I want to pick up a little bit on something Glenn said about um, the size of houses enlarging and, and consumption patterns increasing enormously. In my previous life, I was a dentist. I was a dentist for 30 years before I became elected. And um, I used to give a talk called The Happy Dentist, and it came from a realization that so many of my colleagues, despite the fact that they were very high earning, incredibly successful in inverted commas, um, entrepreneurs and business people and, and caregivers, were pretty miserable. Um, and and it, it led me to, uh, it led me to uh, an investigation of what contentment and happiness individually and collectively really is. And you discover very quickly that the literature and, and lived experience um, confirms that wellness and contentment and happiness have very little to do with wealth and material possessions at all. They have to do with 
the quality of the, your relationships. They have to do with your ability to be grateful for what you have, to contribute to your community, to have meaningful work. All of those things are far more important when it comes to quality of life than the size of your car or your television screen or how many houses you have. And therein, for me, lies one of the great opportunities that we face here, that the idea, the traditional conventional idea that we must have economic growth and we must have more and more stuff for people in order to satisfy their uh, and, and keep people happy is just a complete nonsense. We need all sorts of other things to satisfy us and keep us content and happy, and they do not involve consumption. And for that, I, I, I think that's one of the avenues that we, are, that we will be able to um, swerve past the, the problems that lie ahead. All right, um, so a couple more, one more, and then uh, we will give uh, the audience a chance to get in here. And, and it's a big one, uh, but you can answer it how, how you will. Um, it would be, we've, we've talked, I think, around the federal election. Um, we haven't talked specifically about the federal election. Um, you know, it's, it's looking at this point, and there's a debate tonight, and there are debates coming up that may, make it, may change something. But uh, at this point, it's looking like we're either going to have a, a liberal minority or a conservative minority. Um, so, so what... What emerges from that? What, what, what do you think, um, you know, is, is a liberal minority with uh, some combination of uh, the NDP, the Greens, and the Bloc, um, something that would actually move, move climate um, policy forward? Uh, how does, how does in, as politicians both, how, how does a conservative minority uh, faced with that array of, of people on the climate side who want action some more than others, um, how, how do they operate? So, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't had the mic up. So, um, how do we, uh, what, what's your um, expectation, Glenn, uh, or how would you see, uh, not asking you to call the election, but given, given the outcomes that we're looking at at this point in the election, you know, what kind of policy uh, do we get from that? I, I, I think part of, I mean, I, I think that there's, I think we should pay attention to a very nonpartisan and a very appropriate role the Lieutenant Governor of this province is playing right now in her discussions around democracy, of, as, which is something in a constitutional monarchy that only she can. And what Elizabeth Dowdswell is doing, if you haven't been to see some of the stuff that she's doing, is she is putting forward very broad nonpartisan ideas about the qualities of citizenship and democracy. And that if that becomes a nudge in the way, Peter, that you and your caucus have created more civility in the House. I think that's helpful, and I commend you and your party for that. Um, politics is not what it was when I was mayor. John Godfrey and I became friends because he was the minister responsible for cities, and I was a mayor trying to do a new deal with him and others, and we had that. But there was a great deal of civility at that time in politics that I think would be fair, John, to say is absent today. And so the, the, the loss of civility is a problem. In this election, I, I, I get very disturbed by the narrative that is being created. The, the comment by Andrew Scheer about reducing foreign aid at a time is a climate change position because Canada's retrenchment from humanitarian efforts right now in the face of climate change is one of the most totally terrible things that we could do, in both discrediting ourselves internationally and not rising to the challenge of being, not being that brave Canadian that we were in the last century. The second thing is, I, I, I think the greening of political parties is really important. Um, I, I see that as very difficult. I think that, that there is on the right, uh, the, the culture war has defined climate change as a conspiracy of the left. Um, and it's, it, it's absolutely impossible to get past that. And that the left has to be involved in a culture war. I would suggest that part, one of the things, I'm, I'm working on two things right now. I'm working on this urban lab project in Winnipeg, which I'm out trying to raise money for, which is to, working with business and community to take that city without government and make it a model of a net positive, high productivity, carbon negative, carbon positive, uh, zero waste community. We as Canadians throw out more garbage than any other society in the world, like 
way more, and we use more energy and produce more JHGs than just about anybody else. So there's lots of low-hanging fruit. So I'm trying to take Winnipeg, which is sort of a Goldilocks right size city, and make that a model for Canada, but doing it with the local government, business and community leaders and networks I have, and with the universities, and the University of Toronto has been part of that conversation uh, when, like that to do that. The other thing is I'm working through the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which I was involved with the Asper Foundation and others in realizing on a global conference and movement on the right to food and water in the age of climate change and trying to, trying to and why are we doing that? Because that's the other side of the culture war. It's that everyone understands that people should have a right to food and water. That's why most of us came to this country to get that basic security and, and that's it. But politically, to come back to your question, which I've skillfully tried to avoid, um, <laughs> is that I think it's really a problem. And I got very attracted to the provincial liberals uh, under Dalton McGuinty and the Liberals under, Pierre, under Justin Trudeau around proportional representation. I think it's long overdue in this, and I have friends who have served. I don't know too many people who are MPs who would agree with me on that or former MPs, but, but as someone who's dealt with municipal government and consensus models, that I think right now you would see if we had some stability, very easy to get that. And I think a Liberal Party would take much more aggressive stands on um, climate change if it was reliant on the Greens particularly to do that. I think it would force the NDP to have a coherent position on it, which has been somewhat difficult right now because of the complexity of regionalism. But I, I really think that there's been two pre a premier in this province and a prime minister who ran on proportional representation and got a lot of votes because I think people are frustrated. A lot of people I know are voting just simply to block an anti-climate change agenda, which they perceive the official opposition has, but are, are voting against something. They're not voting because they don't see a party right now that can gain power that has a sufficient condition. I have people who are friends who are voting green because they believe that's the only really truly complete and coherent, but they're doing that with nervousness because they don't want to do it in an area where they could be contributing to the election of someone who would be very problem. Like everyone I know, I've never been in an election where people have had more discomfort in how to cast their vote box in between fear of something terrible happening, especially after recent, some recent provincial elections, which saw just such wholesale destruction of any progress that had been made. At the same time, feeling, can't someone make the positive value proposition for this in a more exciting way? And when there's a party that's doing it, how do I balance my vote to get the right mix? that actually gives me the result I want, which is stronger action on climate change and a better coherent narrative around it and something, a more positive proposition. I think that's really hard to do under our system. Um, and other people who've had more experience in federal politics would probably give you a different perspective on this. But I, I think that's the challenge, I think. I certainly, is, it's the challenge I have. I'm in a seat that is probably gonna vote liberal anyway, but I have friends who are in seats where the Greens have actually a shot at winning and who are working very hard at that. And I think that when I talk to both of them, their agendas are very similar and their fears are very similar. So Peter, I'm not sure you, because I didn't have the mic held up, how much you heard the uh, question, but just a, just a quick um, um, analysis, if you will, of, of what you think may emerge, um, as May has called for a, uh, essentially a war cabinet around um, climate change and and unless the Conservatives or the Liberals, I suppose, win a majority government, that, that may be a possibility. Um, do you see that as a likelihood? Yeah, I, let me start by saying that we have a very interesting situation here on PEI because we, actu we actually have a minority government. The, the governing uh, progressive Conservatives uh, have a minority um, and the, we, we are the official opposition, the Liberals are the third party, and, uh, and it was almost a perfectly proportional result, flukily, um, through the first-past-the-post system. That almost never happens, of course. And for all of my political career prior to being elected, and that stretches back 25 years, I, I have been advocating for proportional representation for all sorts of reasons. And I think the opportunity that we have here in Prince Edward Island through, again, through a fluke, almost a mathematical fluke, is that we can demonstrate that minority governments can get things done and can be stable. And we've already, we've already passed a, a number of very uh, innovative uh, and substantive pieces of legislation, not least of which is the fact that we're the only province now that has carbon targets that are in line with the IPCC 
to make sure that we, we don't uh, go above 1.5 degrees. So th the minority situation is very interesting here. Um, I have no issue with minority governments at all. I think they are wonderful things. You can look back to the Lester Pearson minority government from, from many decades ago where they instituted universal health care and student loans and, and Canadian pension plan and the Canadian flag, all like enormously important um, pieces of legislation, which have, you know, in many ways shaped this country. That was done in a minority situation. So I'm certainly not fearful of a minority. I do truly hope, and I'm trying not to be partisan here in any way, but I do truly hope that enough Greens get elected uh, across the country that they will have some influence um, in whatever parliament is constructed after the election on the 21st. Whether or not, I mean, ideally, I'd love to see a balance of power. Um, whether or not, I mean, that, that, of course, there's so many, so many factors that, that could enter in here. That, but that, that would be lovely. And I, I think I agree with Glenn that a green influence on, on any other minority partner would be profound. I think it would give them a lot more uh, license to do what perhaps they would like to do, but uh, can't utter that in the election campaign, but with a Green partner could actually get some stuff done. All right, thank you very much, Peter. We have a gentleman over here with a mic, and uh, it is uh, your turn. So, uh, I, not shy, I can see. So if you just wanna maybe go to the middle aisle and hand it off, uh, hand off the mic. Just, I'm gonna leave it to you to just go and, uh, Hand it over. I speak as a retired chemical engineer from Ireland, where for the last 70 years, and in Europe, gasoline has cost anywhere from 100 to 300, 200% more than in North America. So carbon tax of $10 a ton, $20 a ton, $30 a ton, you'll see cars in London. Now, I want to be proven wrong. But the elephant or the raptor in the room is liberal democracy. And anyone who believes that liberal democracy is fit for purpose in the culture we have now is in science denial. The science being the human sciences. The, if anyone done any surveys as to why people vote or their knowledge about politics or their human tendencies as ex already exemplified by some of the speakers, it will not work. And we've seen the evidence in this province and all across the Western world. The people of Ireland will do sweet FA if it wasn't for the Europeans telling them what to do. I expect by 2050, we will have, we will have contributed nothing. We'll have over three degrees Celsius plus, and there will be walls built in the rich world and we'll be shooting outside. For instance, Canada has 16 tons per person per annum, one of the highest in the world. In, 30 years ago, when climate change was being warned about, our emissions were 600 million tons. Now they're 700 million tons. What does the NDP government say to the tar sands? And I say tar, the, the forbidden word in the Globe and Mail, tar, T-A-R, they say F-U-C-K is okay to print, but not tar, tar sands. <laughs> now, in, in uh, the speech, you're gonna ask a question. Yeah. Seven, okay, ask a question, please? please somebody, before the end of tomorrow, prove me wrong. Liberal democracy won't do it. Canada will do something when the USA decides they don't want the East Coast with 100 million people flooded. But Canada has no evidence that with all our, we're always boasting about how well educated we are. Prove me wrong by the time we get here tomorrow. I leave there tomorrow. You Thank uh, you. We have two politicians who I think are committed to liberal democracy. Uh, and the gentleman has asked you to prove them, prove them wrong. Well, I, I, just, I just quickly say the project I'm working on right now is a completely grassroots, top-down, bottom-up, trying to take a community at the municipal level and transform it by getting the building owners and the transportation folks to see the value of a complete transformation, like w making the case that if you run your entire trucking fleet on electric motors, you're reducing your cost. So, so I, I believe that you have to have community, and that the University of Manitoba, University of Winnipeg, and Red River College are foundational to that, and it's having universities that have decided with some risk to move outside the norm. And David Pisano is the head of the Exchange District Biz in downtown Winnipeg, and they're actually hosting the steering committee. And we've, we've now got, I mean, 
I go to the states and we've got a $1.1 million offer to do and build this. So I'm finding that you could do that, but it involves people moving outside their comfort zone. I mean, with universities to become actively involved, dare I say it, in what some people would derisively call applied research, is so below a university of any caliber and stature. But we're, you know, we had no problem with using universities to create some of the worst weapons in human history, and no one thought that was a terrible application of applied research. So, so I mean, I think it involves each of us doing different things. And I want to say, I want, I want to thank the Minden family for their great work here, by the way. I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you for that. And also U of T, because I think doing that, I mean, the, you, I mean just look at the, the engineers just built a building in the last two years over there that is a perfect building to have built in 1950. Do you know what I mean? So if the engineering school isn't building net carbon that's demonstrating world-leading technology there, the three world-leading technology buildings in Canada were all built 20 years ago. They're the hydro building in Winnipeg, which is totally passive solar chimney. The Mountain Equipment Co-op store made 96% of the waste product. And Red River College, which is total photovoltaic rails and passive systems, they're the only three major buildings I know of in the country that are at scale close to carbon neutral or that and they're 20 years old, and nothing in that city has happened since. So I think that the way you create change is that. I, I think you're quite correct that while there are useful applications of carbon pricing, it is not a pathway that's going to get us anywhere near to where we do. And I think if you want to see the model, Ontario was at 15% reduction, leading North America better than California, uh, and was tracking towards a 37% reduction by 2030, which was the only jurisdiction outside of Quebec and California, and California was behind us at the time, that was actually tracking to meet really serious reductions aligned with Paris. That's Nova now Scotia gone. was. Nova, and Nova Scotia. Scotia, yeah. No. Yes. And there's some reasons for that that didn't exactly. We don't need to go into it. We, we won't, I won't pick on Nova Scotia, but they, they, they were, they, they, yeah, that's, I will certainly agree it's true. So, so you need, you can't look to big government. It's very hard for big government to do this in the cultural conditions we have right now. You really have to look at yourself and the role that you can play. And I, I, I think I'll shut up now because we need have more time for questions. You've heard a lot from me okay. already. Okay, so. um, more questions. Where's the mic? Well, um, yeah, so that everyone can see, you can just sit down. And, 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 you just and, raise and your Peter, hand? Uh, we'll, we'll pick you up on the, on the next one. I think we want to move through the uh, answers uh, so we get more questions. Sure. Thanks for letting us sit. Um, I wonder, as much as I'm very much on board with the positive statements around Canada, what Canada, Canada can do and what provinces can do, for instance, PEI, is there a stream of consciousness necessary that we need to direct towards changing other producers? Because if we do fix and become beacons, wonderful. But meanwhile, how do changes in China, Russia, Uzbekistan, some of these big polluters get made if we don't get ourselves involved in that too? What are your thoughts on that, please? Uh, Len, let's, uh, let's let Peter pick sure, up go ahead. this one and then you can add your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that, that's so tricky. Um, the, the acceptance that we're part of a global family here and that our future is absolutely interconnected um, is both uh, one of the frightening things about that, about the situation we find ourselves in now, but it's also one of the great opportunities. And uh, I, while we cannot all go to Uzbek, you know, or Russia or China and, and, um, uh, and forcibly uh, create different uh, energy situations there, we can, and I, I think I talked about this earlier, we can be uh, an inspiration through what we do here. And, and in the same way that individually, you know, whether you cycle to work or um, become, in, become completely carbon neutral in, in the way that you live, that, that is in, in practical terms, uh, really not, not a huge contribution but in terms of being a, a, an inspiration and a model for others, it, it can be. And I think that's where Canada's role lies, and Glenn spoke to that very eloquently earlier, that we, we cannot uh, force other national governments to do 
things that we would like them to do, but we can provide a model that says, look, if you change to a clean, sustainable, zero carbon um, economy, not only are you doing the right thing climatically, but you're creating all sorts of opportunities and jobs and a better society and a healthier environment and all of those things. So I, I, I think that's all that we can do. We can, we can be a model and we have to recognize that there are limits to what we can do personally. Can, can I just say, I, 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 my biggest advice would be stop looking at the other and look at yourself. That's my biggest advice. This University of Toronto is an internationally important and powerful institution. It hasn't built one progressive building that comes even close to that. Can you imagine if the faculty and student body said that we're going to be carbon neutral within 10 years and we're going to show every university and college campus? You have engineering and expertise here unique to Canada. There's no other institution. There's no other several acres of land where you have such advanced education knowledge and technology. You have people like Jeff Ozen, the Einstein, who's doing some of the leading work on photosynthesis. Why not apply that to the campus's heating system? Why not take all the work that's going on here and demonstrate it? Why not work with students to do that? Can you imagine U of T being the first place in the world that applies all that? And you have people on lab benches in sociology, on social inclusion, on human race, on dealing with the feminist agenda. Like you could, this institution, if you rose up and said, I am a comfortable person. I'm not living in a refugee camp in Syria. I'm not worrying about whether or not there's going to be food on my table. I have this quality of life where I have the capacity to make a huge difference in the world. I'm going to Merrick Gertler's office with a bunch of my colleagues, and I'm going to say, why aren't we retrofitting every building? Because right now, I lived at Massey College, the Soviet-style heating system, where you have the temperate room, the tropical room. I actually, John Fraser, who was there, actually seated me somewhere in the middle, so I actually had moderate temperatures. And the poor people who were in the subarctic regions at the far building number five, I mean, there is so many opportunities that you could reduce by millions and millions of dollars a year the cost of operating this campus and free up money for good research and teaching here as a co-benefit to becoming a model. Like, why doesn't U of T, and I can tell you having been the Minister of Research and Innovation in this province and the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, if you ask me the one job I would never like in cabinet was that one. Dealing with university presidents was such a treat. Um, uh, but you know, it was very hard to engage university leadership traditionally to get them to act in a socially, corporately responsible role. And this institution I'm in love with. I, I, you've talked T has been incredibly kind to me at many points in my life, and I owe a great deal. But, but the idea of universities taking on transformative leadership, if those of you who are involved in this community could, could organize yourself to do that, would be more powerful than anything I could have done as minister, quite frankly. So I, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here and, and comment on the question because it's one that I, I spent a lot of time covering. I was in um, Copenhagen, I was in Paris, and when I was in Copenhagen and some of the other uh, cops um, under the Conservatives, Canada was considered to be, a, you know, foot dragging, to put it mildly, used to regularly win the Fossil of the Year Award uh, and was not certainly not considered a leader uh, in the, in, unless it was to drag things out. Um, rightly or wrongly, um, when, when Trudeau and, and the Liberals came in, they changed the channel on that. At Paris, they did show leadership in getting the deal done. That leadership ability only lasts as long as they walk the walk. You know, they're great at talking the talk. If they don't walk the walk, there will not, they will not have that leverage internationally. So what we do at home is what gives us the ability to go out in the world and, and engage and lead and work with China and work with the Europeans, which, which Canada has been doing to try to end coal use all the different roles that Canada has played internationally, you don't get to play that role if you're if you're not if you're not delivering on the commitments that you made. I'm feeling greatly inspired by possibilities. Uh, I'm Glenn, your I've just your talk about bottom-up 
top-down uh, social innovation is uh, really is true. I think it's the way to go. What my question is, how do we get that kind of, I think the crisis is a crisis of imagination. It's a global crisis of imagination, as you pointed out. And uh, how do we get that, grab that culture of imagination? How, I think it's through the arts. I think every screenwriter, scriptwriter, actor, musician, visual artist needs to grab onto this. So if we can inspire the arts, I think the, the, the issue of gay marriage, within f five years ago it was like, what? And then it became, so what, in a very, very short time. So how can, uh, there are, I mean, I think Indigenous Climate Action is doing fa fantastically in moving that agenda. Project Drawdown is showing that, yes, things are actually happening and we can scale them up and the science is there and it's evident. So I'm just interested in your comments of how, or your ideas of how we can grab, the, because no politician can act without a constituency, how can we create that consistency in which it, the action is just obvious? To, you know, I, I just, I, I, there must be something wrong, like I'm missing a chip or something. Um, you know, I, I've my entire life been told that everything I wanted to do was impossible because of who I was. I was born without parents. My mother at 16 had to give me up, and I spent years in that without much hope of that. And then at an age, I got adopted into a wonderful family. And then when I started reconciling myself with my own sexual orientation, I was basically told to keep quiet. My father said to me, well, if I can't love you because you're gay, how are you in the world ever going to do that? To standing in front of City Hall in a pink triangle day over raising a flag or something like that, and looking at my friends and saying, why are we standing out here in the rain? Why don't we just take the place over? It's a democracy. And someone looked at me and said, well, gay people don't get elected. I mean, look what happened to Harvey Milk a few years ago. They shot him seven times in the head and chest after he got elected. And, and, and I've constantly been told in my entire life that everything I ever wanted to do was impossible. That we live in this world that is so aware of difference, and especially today, to make you more aware of how you are different than other people than how you are the same. And that is toxic, and it's happening all the time, and the number of dog whistles that are out of there. And university and educated communities of people, it's starting, you can get up tomorrow and live your life an entirely different way. You can take something that is theoretical in your life and make it practical and applied. There's always something that each of us can do in our lives to make a difference that can become viral. I, on my birthday every year, host a party and I sponsor a family to come to Canada that's in some place that. I cannot tell you the transcendent effect that has had. I don't almost ever talk about it. I didn't talk about it when it was politics because it just sounds bad, but I mean, I just, did that, I just realized, that, well, someone helped my grandmother come to here and got her out of a horrible situation where she was the only one who survived a terrible civil war. And how, how do you do that? Like, like I, it's, you can be Greta. Like, like, all of you are powerful people. You can all write, you can all organize, you can all hold meetings. You could, I'm sure some of you in the 60s and 70s maybe occupied a president's office in a university or did something like that. Like, 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 like we have so sold our sense of being citizens short. We live so much in a virtual world that we seem to be disconnected from the real one. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I put on a, at age 60, a, a most unattractive outfit called a skin diving suit to go and understand what was happening with coral reefs. Fortunately, my friends burned all the pictures, but you know, it was going down there and actually seeing the Mesoamerican reef dying before my eyes that actually did that, and then being able to talk about that in the first person. I, I am, on my spare time and weekends, trying to organize this lab. I had no money, I'm not a wealthy person. I've been out raising money to try and do that on weekends because I need to go to bed at night feeling like I'm doing something. I, I believe within five years, Winnipeg will be the world leading set city to show you how to run a city that actually contributes to the reduction of carbon dioxide, is zero waste, and provides for a massively inclusive uh, economy. And I'm just determined to do that. And I found when I started talking to other people, I wasn't alone. Someone was just waiting for someone else to nudge their colleague and say, can we do it? So, I mean, I look at how powerful each of you are, 
how credible you are, the degrees that many of you have. And I know that many of you have dedicated your life to academics and the pursuit of truth, and that in itself, God bless you, is more valuable than anything else. But I think in the next 10 years, we all have to go to peace, not war. And that involves that we have to live our lives with a level of activism that, that our parents and our grandparents do. We have to take on the peace mission in the way that our grandparents took on the war mission. And we have to fight every day with the same level of energy and courage and dedication and sacrifice without having to put our lives on the line. So how far are each of us prepared to go to peace? How far are we prepared to get up tomorrow morning and not take this crap anymore, demand better and do better? I think, I think it just takes a few of us at a time. It will become infectious. Look what's happening with young people. Can't we have an older person? Can't we have a geriatric revolution as well? God, we own enough responsibility to start it. We need a geriatric Greta. Maybe that's one of you. <laughs> Peter, tough act to follow, but uh, if you'd like to uh, address that question as well. Sure, and, and that was a beautiful response, Glenn. Thank you for that. And what gives me hope um, is my absolute belief in the unlimited ability of humanity to be good and do good and be creative and kind. And I, I absolutely believe that the arc of the universe bends towards justice and goodness and peace. And I do believe that inherent in every human being is an opportunity to do, uh, I, I don't wanna, I wouldn't want to try and, uh, and reiterate what Glenn just said, but I absolutely believe that every human being has the potential to, to do something wonderful. And the questioner um, mentioned the arts. And I have a dear friend, um, who lives in Ontario, his name is Mike Nickerson, and he's been working on a sustainability project for all, basically all of his life, and maybe he is the geriatric Greta, but he, he came up with the, uh, what he, he called the, the seven rules of sustainability, and, and I, I want to read them. The well-being, as he puts it, well-being can be sustained when activities use materials in continuous cycles, use continuously reliable sources of energy, and three, come mainly from the qualities of being human, creativity, communication, coordination, appreciation, the arts, spiritual, intellectual development. He then goes on to list the things which do not, which diminish well-being. And Mike wrote them 40 years ago. Um, and I think that idea that not only are the arts and, and, uh, and the creativity which is inherent in being, in being a human being um, part of our inheritance, but it's also part of the solution to what, what we have to do. I, I mentioned earlier about let's stop trying to, to fill holes in, in our discontent by consuming things. Let's love each other. Let's, let's be kind to each other. Let's connect with each other. And I, I think not only will we solve or help to solve the climate crisis, but we will be much more content human beings in, in doing so. All right. That's almost a great place to stop, but we have time for one more one more question. So uh, you you get it. <laughs> okay, uh, Glenn suggests that uh, why don't we have a couple of questions from different people. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity um, for closing. So, say uh, say three 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 questioners. Uh, keep it tight, please, and then uh, and then we'll turn it over to Glenn and Peter to finish up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers and thank you to the moderator. Powerful words everywhere. Um, <clears throat> my question to my interaction with the former minister Murray was at Chiefs of Ontario at the Indigenous Conferences. And my question is with regards to um, <clears throat> climate activism so clearly linked with Indigenous efforts. And maybe, um, and what your comments would be around maybe giving the consideration to giving them the reins back. After all, um, we as newcomers have illegitimately taken the land 
and are living under an illegitimate imported constitution, British North America Act. Uh, by It was by, you know, just a, a tireless efforts of activism that there is even a small mention in the constitution about indigenous rights. So what are your comments around, we came here and in last 100, 200 years have screwed up the climate. Uh, whatever we are doing, you spoke about acceleration, whatever we are doing is just a band-aid solution. Why aren't we talking about liberal government promises when it was declared that that is the most primary promise that was made was each of you ministers had the mandate that was the primary, uh, prim primary pr mandate was the relationship with the indigenous. We haven't done anything. All the major statistics for social determinants are worse than ever for them. Why aren't we seriously considering bringing them in the top of the table when we are talking climate? After all, they are the only ones who hold the knowledge systems of how to manage the climate for millions and millions of years. And they say placing human beings on the top of the chain is not working. The Anthropocene environment is not working. Population is increasing, prosperity for humans is increasing at the risk of everything else. We um, heard a little bit about um, young people and activism in this uh, talk today, but um, in my opinion, I think young people can contribute a lot more than just activism. So my question is, what can be done by the people in power um, to get more young people involved in, in these decisions? Because I think when you bring young people to the table um, to actually affect the solutions and the systemic solutions, then things can get done. So it goes along the line with, with bringing the people to the top that are fighting for, for justice. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming here tonight. It's a wonderful talk. I've uh, learned a number of things. I do have uh, a question, however, around the refunded carbon tax. The uh, social cost of carbon, there's different numbers on it, but one of the all-in numbers that I've seen is $220 a ton. So until we're at $220 a ton, we're subsidizing our own destruction. Uh, I'm fascinated by the analysis from the Parliamentary Budget Office that uh, reports that 80% of Ontario residents will actually make a net profit from the federal refunded carbon tax. They're calling it a price on pollution. Um, now, I, I think the government should have gone and sent checks just to remind people uh, rather than buried in the income tax. And it does concern me that they don't have a border carbon adjustment. But I'm fascinated by what went on in British Columbia. Uh, in 2009, the uh, opposition to the refunded carbon tax was 47%, and in 2016, it's 32%. So it seems like once people get used to the notion of, yeah, gas goes up, but I get the money back uh, in advance, you know, opposition dials down. So give a few years for this, and then whack the tax up by not 20 bucks a, a ton, but 20% um, a year. That'll really go and um, put a dent in the uh, uh, social cost of carbon deficit that we have. Uh, I'd like to hear from you guys. Do you think that'll work? So three, uh, two, two similar questions and one very different one. So uh, you're missing them. Oh, Peter uh, will will sure. respond first. Um, so much of what we've talked about tonight um, is is a demonstration of how we have struggled um, to live well um, on an increasingly uh, crowded and polluted and polarized um, and sick planet. And when I speak to the indigenous people that live here on Prince Edward Island, who have lived here successfully for thousands and thousands of years in community, both with each other and with the rest of creation here, we have so much to learn from them. Um, and so absolutely involving the Indigenous community in the discussion here is, is fundamental. And here on Prince Edward Island, I think I used the term the intimacy of politics here. And because it's such a small place, the ability, 
you know, we know all of the indigenous leaders here on the island. Indeed, we have an indigenous, first indigenous senator, Brian Francis, who sits in the Senate now in, in Ottawa. Very influential people who have not lost that connection to the earth. You know, we've stripped so much away from our Aboriginal peoples. And, but what they have retained is that spiritual connection to the rest of Mother Earth and, and some of their cultural traditions. Again, so much of it has been lost and it's tragic and horrible and painful to look at. But yes, to the first question, we, we absolutely need to do that. And we are doing that here on, on Prince Edward Island. In terms of involving youth, politicians are not good at speaking to youth issues. Um, I would love to see the voting age reduced to 16. And I think that would encourage, I think there would be all kinds of benefits from that, but I think it would encourage, in fact, it would force politicians to deal more closely and more vigorously with youth issues. Um, the Green Party, thankfully, has a very healthy youth wing here on Prince Edward Island, and I think I'd speak to that across the country, perhaps because we're talking to the issues they are concerned about, always have talked to the issues they are concerned about. But I do think that that lowering the voting age is, is one way that we could engage far more youth and, and have politicians who speak to young Canadians in a far more meaningful and robust way. Um, the third question about ramping up the carbon tax um, uh, much more steeply than is being um, suggested by the current federal program. Uh, the, it needs to be done, and absolutely, the level of a carbon tax to be effective by itself has to be in the hundreds of dollars per tonne. That it cannot be the only tool in the toolbox that we use, and it's really important that we don't look at carbon tax as the, as, as the panacea to, the, to reducing carbon emissions. It's a really important and useful, and I, get, I mentioned earlier, the most effective and actually cheapest way to reduce emissions, but it's not the only way. We have to put in all sorts of, of other things as well. Um, I think there would be enormous political challenges to increase it 20% per year. Um, but I think in, a, in the context of all of the other tools that are available, a much more steep increase than is currently being recommended is what's required. Okay, because you're all tired and we all want to go home. So I, I, I just, on Indigenous issues, absolutely. Um, a matter of fact, in my mayor years, I had an elder named Art Choffley who I met with almost on a weekly basis. And I went on a program of transformation and got a spiritual name. And, and I spent all of the time I was mayor learning about Cree and Ojibwe foundations of that. And I came to the conclusion that that is probably the healthiest and the only cultural basis of all of the major world's cultures, certainly for North America, that actually provides a model of values and shared decision-making and respect that actually works. And I do think that it's not a foreign or concept or ethereal thing only, that it's about the fact that we treat each other as human beings as sacred, and we treat everything in nature as sacred, and we think about seven generations. And if we've lost anything in this world, we've commodified everything, our emotions, our love, our world, our relationship, uh, that we have lost a sense of sacred, and that's not the same as religion. And if, we, if you, the, the restoration of our humanity, and, and the, one of the biggest things that we need to survive all of this is the restoration of the sacred, that we see ourselves, each other, and the nature and wonder of the inspiring world we live in as a sacred place and us and treat each other and these places as sacred. Uh, and, and I think that's foundational. My experience with Grassy Narrows was a life-changing experience. 50 years of ministers of all governments and people there are continually being poisoned. When I left office, I was pretty sure it was all solved. The trust fund was passed and all of that and it's still broken. I mean, that was a shining example of cruelty and the relative value of human life. If that was your neighbors in Rosedale, that would not have happened. And the fact that it still is unresolved this day tells you, and, and this was with a premier who was, she super committed. Like, she invested time every day to try and fix that, but the resistance 
that, and the media wasn't helpful. And the political opposition parties traded on it in a way that was destructive. Like, and the bureaucracy was afraid of liability. Like, I cannot tell you, if I was ever gonna write a book, I would write a book on that experience. On young people, lower the voting age, absolutely, maybe lower than that. Um, take a intergenerational equity, have not just a carbon budget, but have an environmental budget, and for each provincial and federal government, that we elect a youth assembly to decide how it is spent, and that that is a proportion of our wealth sufficient to provide the capacity for change, and that is an intergenerational equity fund, and we structure it that the next generation actually has the power to determine a large enough percentage of government spending, obviously, with a competent public service to support that, but I think there has to be some intergeneration. On carbon pricing, I really think we're getting past the point where carbon pricing is going to solve the problem. I think it's important to keep it in place because as long as it's free to pollute and expensive not to, the market forces are going to massively increase pollution. But I, I, I do agree with you that pools of money, I think the mistake that was made is the carbon cap and trade system was generating billions of dollars every year and was going to really generate soon over $10 billion in Ontario. That was going to give grants and started to $20,000 to people, which is what you need to fix your home. It was going to basically pay for the electric motor in your car that you would have basically been into a forced saving program by paying it at the pump and basically made it incredibly cheap to own an electric car. And then you're eliminating the cost of fuel. The entire program in Ontario and the Green On program was designed basically to eliminate the cost. So if you're a senior woman living by yourself, the changes that are going to be made in your home are going to reduce your cost of living. The transportation cost, massive unprecedented investments in rapid transit and that. It was going to change the technology platform and the cost, and it never got to that point. But I think you're seeing in California the success of that is because you're seeing massive reinvestments and largely due to Kevin DeLeon in low income, transformational in people's quality of life and the cost of their housing and their transportation choices. And you need that massive transfer transformation. I really do believe at this point that we don't have the runway left. We only have a few years uh, for Canada because if we're gonna do it, the rest of the world has to have a few years. And if we're gonna play that leadership role, you know, if you're going to do this in two or three or four years, you need literally need C.D. Howe. You need something like we said before the Second World War. We're going to completely transform the entire technology platform. And the other way to do it is hopeful. My friend David here, who heads up the Exchange Biz, the Business Improvement Zone in downtown Winnipeg and the Exchange District has taken on the role of leading this transformation. This, these are businesses, you know. Um, so I think you'll find hope. But I just want to come back to this last thing. It's all about you, baby. It really is. It's all about you. If everyone in this room got up tomorrow and started doing things differently and could, could each could convince once a week someone else you know to do, become a bigger activist, to become like a Minden <laughs> and play that role, you'd change the world quickly. You know? And I say that as someone who went into politics when there was not even the concept of a gay person getting elected. And I lived in a few short years to where I became mayor of a major Canadian city and then had the privilege to go on and play a major role in this country in city building policy. So, you know, all of you are able to do these things. And, and, and you just imagine when you're taking your last breath of your life and you remember this moment where all of a sudden you became an activist and you decided that you were gonna spend a couple of hours every day out to change the world and change your neighbors and change the dialogue and change the outcomes. And you were just gonna figure out what you do because each of you have a gift. Each of you have something that you're really good at that we need right now in this fight. And we need you to give it now. Thank you. Sorry, we're gonna wrap it up. Okay. Thank you. Um, Peter, thank you for uh, attending virtually. I know it's not the ideal, but we appreciate your low carbon footprint and you're contributing to normalizing that this is the way we should do things in the future. So thanks thank to you. all of you for this excellent conversation. Thank you.